This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. Joining us today for a very special Coffee with Kenobi to talk about and celebrate the ending of Season 2 of The Mandalorian, Chapter 16, The Rescue, are our MVPs of Coffee with Kenobi. First, we're going to bring in Tom Gross. Well, hello, everybody. It's great, as always, to be on the show. Oh, boy. Looking forward to this conversation for sure. Been kind of holding my breath. Yes, we, as always, we have not talked at all, even text in person. Of course, we don't really see each other. Uh, or in any way, shape, or form, because we've been saving it for the show. We also have with us to help, who has also been someone who we've not shared anything with until now, Mr. Corey Club. Hello there. Glad to talk this with, about you guys, with you guys. And oh boy, I feel like I've been holding it in. You know, it's like, uh, you know, just, <laughs> you know, experiencing it, but also, you know, having played D&D online with you guys, I uh, didn't talk at all, but uh, it was fun. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a, this is a big episode. That's right. We did all play Dungeons and Dragons a couple of days ago remotely on Roll20. Well, we didn't talk at all about the Mandalorian, but now the the Mandalorian gloves are <laughs> off and we are ready to jump into it. Guys, let's just start off with a letter grade and an overall sort of reaction to the episode. Corey, we'll start with you. Letter grade. Wow, this this is a fantastic episode. Um, I couldn't be more happy with this finale. Um, it brought a lot of things together for the season, the last two seasons. Uh, a lot of surprises, a lot of excitement, a lot of action. Uh, it was fantastic. Got the A plus um, because it was just a lot. It was. I mean, I know we as fans, you know, try to figure out what's going to happen next, and knowing how the season has went, you know, they kind of popped popped up all kinds of different types of, um, you know, Easter eggs and things and hinted at things. And this is a really, really gave us a lot in this episode, and I was really it paid off very, very well. Um, and that's what I think was really nice about this episode. It didn't leave us necessarily hanging a whole lot. Uh, a lot of um, good moments. Uh, so, wow, it was really fantastic. I think it's probably my favorite episode this entire season. Wow. Tom, I'm not surprised. Tom, what about you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Corey, you, you, I, I, I was going to say my grade for this is A+, plus. change my mind. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> no need. <laughs> so I, and I give it this. I give it that grade uh, because this this episode, in my eyes, has everything I want from a final episode. Um, and and I'll tell you, this series in I don't know. To me, the series has remained unbelievably focused on the main story, mm. and that's a crazy thing to say because we've had like several like off the beaten path stories that come back, but everything always comes back to I'm getting the child to where he's supposed to be. And, Mm -hmm. and there were places where I thought maybe he was starting to have some second thoughts. Maybe he was regretting that decision. He was going to maybe keep, you know, I I don't know that ever felt that that was going to happen, but I feel like this, this, this season could have gone so many different directions. And I'll say, I think that this, I think this final episode tips its hat to many of those side stories that I kind of thought that maybe we're going to get into the weeds on, but then it always came back to what, what the whole purpose of the first and second seasons were. And that was to get the child where it was supposed to be. He or she, he was supposed to be. So a plus on that because it gave me everything I wanted. It gave me some things. I it, it went places I didn't think it was going to go or I didn't know. And in if it was like you said, Corey, it's filled with action. It was filled with some oh my gosh, some uh, some Kleenex moments, some tissue moments, and just uh, it just <laughs> had it had everything. I would say I'm going to give this an A plus, but I don't feel like that's high enough of a grade. I think I think it's so. I mean, I think it's. Uh, phenomenal, incredible, powerful, spectacular. I I loved it, guys, so much. I cried, I laughed, I clapped, I cheered, I hugged my son. I had about four and a half hours where I felt like I had just drank about a case of Red Bull. 
I was so <laughs> yeah. screwed up. Yeah. And Tom, you weren't, you weren't, you, I didn't see you at school on that day that I came out and I was just on fire bouncing around. I was mm. so, so, so happy, but that doesn't mean there weren't a lot of ups and downs throughout the episode. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. And we're going to try to do this too. I've, I've sort of broken down the episode into five or six separate little sections. So I just want to talk about okay. each section individually. Now, the first section to me is the sequence on you know, the Lambda class shuttle that is you know, reminiscent of Return of the Jedi, the beginning of that. I want to talk mm-hmm. about that particular opening sequence up to when they get onto the Star Destroyer. So let's just talk about okay. them flying, getting, you know, taking over the ship and those conversations that happen there. And Tom, what stands out to you about that? Because to me, we learn a lot of important information about how the galaxy works. Yeah, well, you know, what struck me uh, first, I, I just, I have to say, probably the the snapshot, I don't know, there's so many snapshot moments of this, but but one of them that I hope is a card in in, in the card trader, Star Wars card <laughs> trader, is when, um, when they finally hit the Lambda shuttle with the ion cannon, and then they're sitting in the cockpit, and Boba Fett has already informed them, you know, we're gonna we're gonna board you, all this kind of stuff. And he brings Slave One up in front of the the, oh, yeah. the, the windshield of that Lambda class, and I just I looked at my daughter and I go, oh, is that awesome? <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, I don't know. I think I think you guys are in the same camp as I am. Slave One is a legendary mm-hmm. ship. And that was exactly how I wanted to see that ship portrayed in that moment. I mean, intimidating, threatening, everything. Because these are these are imps, as they're calling them. These are the imps, and they are and they are nasty and they're dirty. And while they while the Imperials are calling for order, I feel like these Imperial pilots in this particular case, I feel like they're so like mean and nasty and i don't have a death threat is anybody else in this but you know and he looks back at the at the doctor and so probably one of the most important things that i got from this is we got confirmation i don't know and and maybe it was just confirmation for me maybe we've known this all along but that is that dr pershing is a cloner and i i suspected that but this is am i right is this the first time we get actual confirmation that that is what he does you are correct mm-hmm. okay so yep. i found that to be really important um and then the second the second piece of that is when when that pilot is holding um dr pershing uh, hostage he's got the gun to his head and he starts taunting cara dune i don't know that that really, when I say it bothered me, it didn't bother me as a fan, or it bothered me as a fan, not as a, like, I don't think there's any, I thought it was a beautiful moment uh, on that shuttle, but it bothered me because he just, he was tormenting her. I saw the tear. I saw the tear. I was on that Death Star, and I love how she quips, which one? <laughs> you know, so she stands strong, <laughs> but man, I just, you, you can just feel the blood boiling, and you can see that there's still this raging hatred between the two of them, really. I mean, and then she, you know, blasts him in the face. And so the second, I guess the third point I want to make about this passage, and then I'll, I'll, I'll concede, or uh, uh, what is it when Congressman uh, let the next person talk? Um, my, my next important thing that I took from all of this was um, uh, was the how brutal this this part was, and, and and other parts of the of the episode were as well. But they they started out hot, which is what I've appreciated about this series. We talked about this with um, with the uh, the Jedi episode, um, you know, just coming in hot with Ahsoka right from the start. There's no messing around. There's no goofing around. There's very little. Um, setting of the scene, they just go, and I felt like this one started that same way. But it's it, there is they're they're not pulling punches, so to speak. The pilot shoots his co-pilot just straight up. Cara Dune takes care of that guy, and you know, and and it's just there's a brutality to this one. But it also gives me the sense of finale. That this that this is this is it. They have had it. They have had enough. The Imperials have the child. They're getting that child back. A tough act to follow, Corey. Any anything to add to that? Yeah, I I, I agree with you, Tom. It being brutal, and 
I, you always you always hear about the debate of uh you know the P- personnel and the Imperials on the Death Stars that had lost their life with the explosions, obviously, and tend to like kind of forget about that sometimes. And this guy obviously is passionate about that. Like, hey, you know, I was part of this too, and I've seen my share fair share of you know deaths and whatnot. So there there's a kindred moment there i think for both sides and you kind of have to pick and choose they they kind of give the audience a, a chance to say well, what side are you going to root for you know um and it's interesting to, that moment uh, because that's outside the bounds of the mandalorian that I, we've seen so far the outskirts this is a very core world problem uh an issue battle going on and that kind of brings it to the forefront and obviously cara dunes have kind of been um you know kind of that moment for us she's seen some action as a uh, rebel trooper and you know, and, and it's interesting to see her her character grow as well through this series. Um, you know, like you said, Tom, she's just blast the guy in the face, and, and they're not messing around here. I, I agree, but you know, you said we're going to talk up to the docking bay scene, and uh, I, I think I enjoyed the the recruiting Bocatan and Koska Reeves uh, scenes better. Um, was they fall oh, yeah. back into? Yeah, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, it's fun to see these characters come back into the Mandalorian and and see them talk about you know their past and what's kind of driving their motives. Um, so it, again, it's it's we're seeing a lot more of the galaxy uh, as it is as we know it as fans. We, we've seen and Mandalorians. I don't know if he's learning this for the first time uh, or or in the sense of he doesn't care. You know, he kind of his he has his one mission. And he's set out to finish it. I think that. Uh, go ahead. I was just. I'm sorry. I was just going to say. I, I, there's. There's a piece there that I wanted to uh, mention, and that is, uh, Corey, when you said that you know they they have this kindred. They both have losses, and I've heard that before on the imperial side. You know, we lost people on mm-hmm. the Death Star too, and I've, I have always had sympathy for that, and it has made me kind of pause and think about that loss. But for some reason, in this instance and in this series. I don't have that sympathy for the for the Imperials. Mm-hmm. They, be, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's because of their nastiness about it or their ruthlessness about things. I mean, you, you know, you go back to the end of first season one when the stormtrooper punches the bag that has the child in it, and we have sort of that yeah. like just yeah. dirty play. When he says that about the Death Star, I, I really didn't feel bad for him in this one, and I, I'm maybe I'm just heartless, but I really feel like they've they've painted a picture of like. A, a different kind of picture of the Imperials in this one. Right. Well, no, you're right. I think you're right in the sense of, of you know, not that they're, any, they're they've lost lives and, and had casualties as well, but I think they've caused a lot more casualties than, than, you know, mm-hmm. it, it brought upon themselves that, that, that type of thing. So, yeah, it, it's just interesting. You bring a good point about them being brutal in the sense of they're taking out their actions and, we went further into this episode, and I think Moff Gideon has some some words as well that are interesting from his perspective. Yeah, I think the most important sequence about the opening thing, yes, that that shot of Slave One slowly cascading above the shuttle was, was pretty breathtaking, and really, really <laughs> ILM continues to just set the bar yes. so in, insanely high. But the conversation between that officer and Cara Dune is 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 critical. Because we've seen this in Lost Stars with Claudia Gray. We've seen it in other things where you're asked to consider what how the Empire might feel about the losses on the Death Star, particularly Star Wars Battlefront. And, uh, you know, the Oh yes. She she makes a yep. uh Iden Verzio is a is a major aspect of that. And, and of course she eventually joins the rebellion. Sizes. Joins yep. Yep. You know, eventually. But we we've seen that. In literature, we've seen that video games, but we've never seen it in live action Star Wars. So to introduce that critical wrinkle, I think, is really nice and very nuanced. And yes, it was a little disturbing. Honestly, it's it's a little tricky because this shows me that Star Wars is being made in, in two thousand in the two thousand twenties. You know what I mean? Because yeah. when Star Wars was created, George wanted very clearly to delineate between good and bad. He didn't want to be moral ambiguity. You know, he was very clear about he wanted good and bad because this was said during the Vietnam conflict. So now we've introduced new wrinkles, which shows the stars just kind of evolve at the time. So good, bad, or indifferent, I think it's, an, it's, I think it's important, and I think that it's interesting. But obviously then we know the direction it looks like uh, Dr. Pershing is going to help them, and he sort of disappears in this episode after he shows them how to get into the yeah. thing, but I guess that's really not that important. 
uh, you know, you've got to be, you got to be specific and exact with the storytelling when you've only got 46 minutes and you've got to wrap up the season. Yep. So we go and Corey, you mentioned earlier, they go to a, a planet. They want the one challenge has always been this way for the Mandalorian is we never really find out what planets they're on. So that's to me as a star Wars fan, that's a little frustrating because I like to know, but eventually it will come up. So they go down he goes to recruit Bo-Katan and then um, Sasha Banks' character. It was a Cosca Reeves. Is that her name? Cosca Reeves. Yeah. Yeah. And so something, something fascinating happens. They walk in and there's this wonderful sequence. Talk about wanting a, a yeah. top card of Boba Fett and Din Djarin standing next to each other. Mm-hmm. Right inside a mm-hmm. cantina, like Mason said, Hey, you remember the very first episode of season one, a Mandalorian walks into a cantina. Now he's walking in with Boba Fett. I'm like, wow, good call. Her. Mm-hmm. So I walk yep. over there, and there's a very interesting exchange. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of, um, you know, sort of one-upsmanship uh, between the, these four mm-hmm. Mandalorian-clad figures. But Tom, it, one of the things that I think kind of gets a little bit confusing is suddenly we're like, wait a minute, Boba Fett isn't a Mandalorian. He was Mandalorian. Now he's not Mandalorian. What do you make? Kind of what's going on with that? Yeah, that that got that got kind of tricky. Um, but I, my mind is stuck on uh, your intro of this scene, and it only brings to mind uh, the opening of a joke. A Mandalorian walks into the bar with a clone and a <laughs> rebel jump trooper. Uh, but yeah, so so yeah, I, I that we we kind of scratched our head on that one um, because he doesn't when when he's when he's called out, he doesn't try to argue. He just says, "This is my father's armor," and like I would have thought that he would have done the same defending there as he attempted to do with, uh, not attempted, as he did with uh, Din Djarin, where he brings up the, the line. And, you know, not so much that he'd show the, the family line, but just say, hey, my, fa- my father fought in the Clone Civil, you know, or in the uh, Mandalorian Civil War. You know, but he didn't do any of that. And, I, and it is a little bit of a head scratcher. Other than, I have to wonder if, there's, if there has been, or I'm sorry, not, not has been, but knowing his background, you know, as, as a clone, if there's something there that's just deeper that, that he decided not to uh, pursue that. And, you know, and at the same time, he, he wants to get business done. He's, he's fulfilling a, he's fulfilling a, a, a duty to get the child back. So why are we messing around with these two? It Let's seems see. to me that there could almost be like a history. I mean, who knows what Mandalorian is more about Boba Fett, you know, but I mean, that sequence when Boba when Bo Katan says, you know, I've heard your voice a thousand times. I love that part. We do get confirmation yeah, that too. this is not new armor. This is in fact Django's armor that's been repainted. So I think that's cool. And it does yeah. stand the reason that that Boba Fett, you know, you know, Mandalorian isn't isn't a religion, it's, it's a creed. So mm-hmm. Boba Fett didn't mm-hmm. take that creed. His father was murdered in front of him by a Jedi. So he has yeah. a different agenda. And he's had a very, very rough life. And we see that in the Clone Wars and in you know, we're going to talk about Boba Fett towards the end of the show, of course. But, uh, Corey, you mentioned that you liked this sequence a lot, sort of the conversation, the banter. There was a really cool fight sequence. Go ahead and, and walk us yeah. through that. Not necessarily a summary, but just kind of things that you think are important. Yeah, I think it's important to, to know that Bo Katan is very much a loyalist to the Mandalorian. Uh, you know, livelihood. And you can see that through her actions, her speech. Obviously, she's very much has a mission to get the dark server back and, and in, in combat as we know how that's won. So this cantina scene purely is about Boba Fett versus Costco Reeves and then Bo-Katan only caring about getting Mandalore back. And the Mandalorian flat says, look, right. I, you can have whatever. I don't care. Just, I just want the kid. Yeah. I want to get the child. That's all I'm focused on. And, and then right. they all agree to unite and go together because they all have, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Although none of these people are enemies, they just have, as you said, Corey, they have different, different yeah. sort of yeah. um, motives, but, sure. but the similar in goal and sight, and they want to bring peace, and whenever they want to get rid of the empire, they all have different reasons to dislike Moff Gideon and or to dislike the empire. There's no doubt about that. So we come up with this plan, and then there's mm-hmm. this great, exciting sequence where Bo-Katan is, is flying the, the Lambda class shuttle. And we get to see a ton of cool stuff, Tom. First, we get to see how TIE Fighters launch, which reminded me of Star Wars Squadrons, the video game. Mm-hmm. But it's just really, really thrilling to see that. And again, ILM just really kind of taking it out of the park, aren't they? 
Absolutely. I, yeah, I thought that was a very cool, um, very cool feature. And it, I, I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm going to make this comparison. You know what I thought of when I saw them shoot out of the front of that was the way um, the Vipers shot out of the Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I just thought that was yep. cool, and it, you know, but it exactly. was it was it was a really cool feature to that light cruiser, um, and something I I just hadn't never thought about. And another thing that I thought was cool was you know you never really think about I mean unless you're playing Rogue Squadron or or, or um, you know one of those games where you're uh, you're flying. This is why I always have trouble with the flying games. You know, when, the, when that TIE fighter was coming out of there, when they were heading in, like he didn't see, he couldn't see, he didn't see it coming. And you just think, you know, when you have a backdrop of blackness and stars, you wouldn't see things until you're right on top of them. And so, I, I don't know, I thought that, I did, there's a part of me that really thought, man, there's some serious reality to that. Um, hmm. But I have to say, one of my favorite lines of this uh, sequence was when they come out of, when they're coming out of hyperspace, you know, she tells Boba Fett, make it look real. And he says, keep the shields up, princess. I'll put on a good show. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my gosh. And to watch his flying, you know, that, you know, I, I mentioned already, Slave One is a pretty legendary ship in my mind. But to watch him fly that and navigate, you know, all that and to see all the toys and tools that he's got. I didn't know he had an ion cannon in there. You know, I knew he had the seismic charge, but I had no idea there's an ion cannon on there as in addition to the lasers on the sides and then the ones at the bottom or at the, the tip or whatever that, however you're shaping uh, the ship as it's flying. I thought, you know, lots of visual effects that I thought were very, very cool um, in that sequence. Um, and I don't know, I, I always think it's it's funny how the Lambda class shuttle seems to be always what the rebels or the resistance or someone who's trying to infiltrate the empire. It always seems to be a Lambda class, <laughs> whether it's the rebels yeah. or the rebellion or whatever. So, no, I think I, I totally agree with you. The, the visuals are phenomenal in this, in this sequence. Why would anyone in the empire ever trust a shuttle again? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It's like a... Never mind. Okay, yeah. So then, uh, so that was kind of a cool first, just getting to see that. But Corey, then we get something mm -hmm. that I think is going to be talked about for a long time, and it should be the sequence where we've got four characters that storm this Imperial Star Destroyer. They're all women. They're all incredible characters. They're all tough as nails. I, I think mm -hmm. this is something to be celebrated. Kind of walk me through. I mean, you know, you have. Daughters, Tom, you have daughters. I mean, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on how important and how cool that sequence was because there is some action in this that is insanely cool. It's interesting you 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 ask about that because as I rewatched it this afternoon, just kind of prep and just kind of just kind of take it in another time. This became my favorite sequence of the of the episode, cool. um, and I don't. It, it didn't. It, it, it was just. It was such a great idea because I, I loved that these characters came together. And like you said, we all got, kind of said they, they have a, a cause in mind. They're all looking to achieve an end goal is to, to save the child or, or uh, rescue the child. And these four women, they split off into a kind of a group. And man, they are awesome. I, <laughs> just their, their, their no-nonsense banter, their, uh, their readiness to just take on these stormtroopers, and it's like a one, they're one hits, just every boom, 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 boom. And they all have, I feel like they all have their own uh, unique um, fighting styles. Uh, I, I really appreciated uh, Finnick Shand and kind of sneaking around and doing her kicks and, and kind of power moves where, uh, you know, Cara Dune was more flat. of the, the heavy gunner. Yeah. What's that? She's like She'll kick you and do this massive move and take you out and then she'll just blast you point blank. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Like, oh, yeah. She's scary. lethal. Oh, she is I a mean, She's exactly. She is these, these are these are all characters who have uh, seen many battles. That's the thing. It's like they're not messing around like we said before. Like they're getting they're mowing these guys down and you know using their jetpacks. I love the the also the sequence where they got off the ship and uh, I think it's Bo-Katan like takes out her her uh, grappling hook and you know takes one guy up and then uh, Casca Reeves come does like a knee knee kick yep. with her jetpack. Oh <laughs> man, what an awesome like like that's the thing too. These characters. And these these performers are are ex on top of their game. I mean, 
I wouldn't expect I these these uh, actresses to not be doing the, the stunts themselves. I mean, honestly, they're just all powerhouses and definitely get the job done. But this was one of my favorite sequences, them just moving through the ship and moving towards the uh, the front uh, of the ship to we can you know meet up with you know what their plan was basically. So uh, really cool sequence. I really love this again. Like you said, Dan, this is this is something we have not never seen in live action Star Wars before. Th- uh, four female characters just you know taking ownership of what they do best. That there's uh, like that, those sequences, like her doing that shot, like right through that circle, Fennec Shand. All the cool stuff yep. with the Mandalorian jetpacks. That great sequence where that stormtrooper falls through that looks like a force field, but they just kind of float right through oh. space. <laughs> this yeah. totality, uh, wow! It was it was almost like a ballet, though, to a degree, wasn't it, Tom? It sure was. Um, I wrote down in my notes the the quartet of doom. I mean, they <laughs> they were. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking, I mean, you know, take Jedi out of the picture. What four other yeah. fighters do you want to have, um, you know, in your invasion team, you know? And so, you know, I, I go back to, so when I realized what was happening, you know, first it, it didn't quite hit me right away. And it was about when they got to that cargo room that I looked, I'm like, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. It was when they were on the bridge. And I was like, there, this is, this is the, this is all women. And I looked, I looked out of the corner of my eye at my daughter. And then when they got mm-hmm. into the cargo room, I like watching her face and she was like, Oh, Oh, ugh. <laughs> like, it was like me <laughs> watching Rocky <laughs> movies at her age, Oh, cool. Thanks. you know? And, and she goes, she says to me, she goes, why, why, why are they like kicking and stuff? Why aren't they, they're just, just shoot them. <laughs> and I said, why, why do you think? I said, you tell me, I tell me, why do you think? And she's like, show off i said if you could do that wouldn't you show off too i said you know i mean it's, <laughs> it's intimidation it's their it's their style and i said you know they, they could just walk through and shoot but you know why you know why would why would harrison ford try to fist fight with some you know with someone on the on the streets of of uh, whatever uh, the, the seat you know but but why would he do that? Oh, wait, he's got a gun. You know, and he could shoot them all, but it's, he's faced with a guy with two swords that he can't. He shoots them. So I'm like, it, it's, you know, it, I just, oh my gosh, it was such a, it was such a wonderful moment, and it goes back to that, you know, that br- that brutality um, that goes into it. But it was just, it was so powerful, and it was empowering um, as I as I watched the person sitting next to me watching that. You know, I was just like, I was like, what I said, after it was all done, I said to her, was, was that just awesome or what? And she goes, D- dad, that was so cool. <laughs> there, there's so many key, like moments, like just the techniques, the fighting, the fighting styles, you know, yeah. everybody is very much has their own uh, sense of style, agency and power. Mm-hmm. And it, it, the empire has no chance. Like I felt even more like, I mean, yep. I feel like this show, especially the last couple of episodes have really put the war in star Wars. I think it's very, very clear. This is sort of these guerrilla tactics and and how powerful and, and how important it is to have purpose. And they all have purpose. But no one has purpose like Din Djarin, who comes out of the smoke, walks down mm. the ramp, and then the plan is for him to go in there solo. And one thing we haven't talked about is we've still got the threat of the Dark Troopers. He has been given a cylinder yeah. to deactivate this doorway so that they can come through and wreak havoc. So we, you kind of forget about that, but there's this great pacing. Like Peyton Reed is a director of this. He directed Ant Man. He also what's the other episode that he directed? He directed uh, was it the Frog Lady episode? I believe it was. Uh, I think so. Yeah, it was. It was. And yep. so so he he does that. He he creates this pacing where they're they're constantly charging these things up, and they're slowly moving moving in sync with each other, and they they kind of step out in time together turn towards the door there's the animation is just very powerful one escapes and mm-hmm. um we'll just go back to you for this the, the fight that din Djarin has talk about how you were feeling when you were watching the din Djarin get pummeled by this fearsome droid yeah i mean how can you feel anything but fear that this might be it like that at, at this moment he this this these dark troopers are like impervious and all i kept thinking was just get the spear 
just get the spear, just get the spear. But you know, he has so many tools at his disposal and the spear is probably the last thing on his mind. But when that, that thing just manhandles him, it picks him up, it throws him against the wall. And when he pulls his fist back to, to like slug him, I thought for sure he was going to try to, to like dodge out of the way. But I think the, the, the trooper had him so tight up against the wall that I thought, Thank goodness for pure Beskar, man. Holy <laughs> cow. And the fact that he kept pummeling his face, and instead of the helmet cracking, it just kept going further back and back and back into the wall. I just, this, it seemed hopeless. Like it seemed like a battle that he couldn't win. And I just, you know, and I just think back to that episode where, he, where Ahsoka hands him the spear. If it weren't for that, if it weren't for that, and picking up that, that tool, this this would have been the end of the show. I mean, quite frankly, I don't know how he could have <laughs> defeated that without the Beskar spear and shoving that up into the guy underneath the mask of the of the dark trooper. But it definitely shows, you know, and it takes me back to, you know, it seems it, it, it takes me back to um to the beginning to the openings of the empire where it seems like a lot of these leaders had their pet projects. You know, uh Krennic has the the Death Star. Tarkin has, um, or am I, am I mixing something up here? Tar- no, uh, Thrawn, Thrawn has the, um, has the Thai the defender. Thai, yeah. The, is that, no, not Thai defender. The, the, uh, the, the tri Thai. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can't remember, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. He has those. And so it's kind of like, so Moff Gideon has a pet project as well. And it's these dark troopers. And so like all of these guys have these special things and this just seems to be, this seems to be a major threat, especially in a situation like this where you have, you know, these small incursions, which is what the rebellion thrived on, by the way. And so it seems like a logical pet project for him to have. Um, And so I just, I saw, I saw the, this, the, the massive danger. Now I, 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 by the way, it was tight. Okay. So, there is a part of this uh, of the sequence that I, I want to go back and talk about, but I I want to let Corey talk about the the dark troopers first, and then and if we can come back, yeah. I'd love to address a piece of of this sequence I thought was just magnificent. Good idea. I tell you what, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and get Corey's point of view, and then Tom's going to circle back on a thought from the beginning moments of the rescue. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Star Wars Celebration is Lucasfilm's love letter to the fans, and sharing excitement, passion, and celebrating everyone in the Star Wars fan community is what Star Wars Celebration is all about. We have so many great memories of Celebration, meeting incredible fans, the amazing panels, the fun things you can do after Celebration, the merchandise. It is phenomenal. This is a great opportunity for you this year to celebrate the 40th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back and to show appreciation for all the fans who have helped immortalize this film Star Wars Celebration is giving you a chance to win the complete Empire Strikes Back merchandise collection from the Star Wars Celebration store. Over 30 pieces of exclusive merchandise and four Jedi Master VIP tickets to Star Wars Celebration Anaheim 2022. Enter now for your chance to win by visiting StarWarsCelebration.com. And while you're there, check out the complete lineup of exclusive, one-of-a-kind Star Wars Celebration merchandise. Shop over 150 different Star Wars items, including pins, apparel, collectibles, Exclusives from Geeky Tiki, Shag, Bestman Mining Company, an entire collection of products inspired by The Mandalorian, and more. Head to StarWarsCelebration.com to enter for your chance to win now or through December 31st. Good luck, and may the Force be with you. No purchase or payment of any kind is necessary to enter or win this promotion. Void or prohibited. Open to U.S. and U.K. residents of 50 U.S. states and D.C. 18 plus years. Limit one entry per person per drawing. Odds depend on number of eligible entries. Drawing begins 5 p.m. Eastern, 12, 11, 20, ends 11, 59 Eastern, 12, 31, 20. Official rules and entry available at www.starwarscelebration.com. Sponsored by Reed Exhibitions, a division of R-E-L-X-I-N-C. MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is your one-stop shop for your vacation needs and your plans to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or the cruise lines. Travel looks much different now than it did a couple of months ago, and with the opening of Walt Disney World and soon, hopefully, the opening of Disneyland, you need a place to go where you can trust and they will help you 
figure out and navigate all the different circumstances and guidelines that Disney has put out for you. And I can say that we had our vacation modified, and as soon as dates were announced, MEI contacted me directly to help me reschedule, which is exactly what I was hoping to do. So if you are interested in rescheduling your vacation or want to try to plan a Walt Disney World, Disneyland vacation, or anywhere else you want to go on the planet, be sure to contact MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. Their signature service and expert advice will help you maximize your vacation time and dollar, and they will help you figure out all the different changes and modifications going on at the Disney theme parks. They are amazing, and I can tell you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, the peace of mind that Becky Mencken and the crew at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel have given me is invaluable. If you're interested at all, again, go to www dot coffee with Kenobi dot com slash mouse fan travel. I felt the dark troopers were kind of haunting when he says activate dark troopers and that music starts up that that kind of that robotic uh, alert, you know, sounding the music of this whole episode is really fantastic. It really plays to each of the yeah. sequences. But this is these made these guys, uh, you know, very haunting. The red eyes glowing. My kids are kind of oh, you know, wow. We we haven't we've still only seen them in action one time. But as you were talking, Tom, maybe think of something around their, you know, they're going up against uh, Din Djarin. Um, you know, as Marvel fans, we always wonder what Wolverine's claws would do to Captain America's shield. And this is kind of one of those moments. Like yeah. these guys are made out of you know tough armor. I, I, alloy of some sorts that Beskar maybe we don't, you know and and Mandalorian has Beskar on and he's got the pure Beskar um, you know spear it's just almost like these powers of you know two strong things going against one another what's going to win you know and it's really interesting and he does struggle with this thing just one of them and uh, it's just fascinating to see this, this sequence play out he tries fire he tries his rockets he tries everything you know and nothing's really working so it's it's really kudos to you know kind of playing out through the other episodes and using all his tactics and things uh but i i love this fight it was really cool uh and very uh, very ominous uh as far as dark troopers go and i i like their design i also wanted to note too that uh, i think it's dr pershing it said the third generation design uh that we took out the human element that was the flaw or something i thought wow that's really interesting you know they've been through the trials, and these guys are the best because they have the they've lost, they have no emotion. They you know there's nothing left, so they're pretty brutal um, as far as their tactics and uh, programming goes. I think it was very cool, by the way, that the Empire, which you know originally was, uh, you know under the the control of of Palpatine, and he used droids to help divide up the galaxy, and then the Empire went away from droids and went with stormtroopers, and now they went back to droids again. Yeah. kind of make it full circle which is was rather entertaining and this is in the, the dark troopers the setup of the dark troopers the dominance of the mandalorian throughout this entire series of how powerful he is and how effective he is in combat he is a one-man wrecking crew more than formidable for just about anybody the only person we ever really gave many trouble was ahsoka and he didn't even really try with ahsoka because he knew he was out of his league so to yeah. see him in this much trouble in this much danger of losing his life and losing his mission of finding Grogu because of the way this thing toys with him. The 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 constant pummeling in his face, I kept thinking, thank goodness for Beskar. Thank goodness this thing is <laughs> that he won't take off that helmet because he would be absolutely crushed into a pancake or worse. And so you just feel this intense fear and dread. And this is not the only time that Mason and I looked at each other and said, my palms are sweaty. I'm so nervous right now because mm. the music, the pacing, the danger of the dark troopers, uh, the the, re- the sense of relief you feel when they go flying out into space, even though you just kind of have a sense in the back right. of your brain that it's not, that's that's too easy. I that's even said to Mason, that, okay, that's too easy. Something's going to happen. By the way, we I do uh. think it's fair to say that these dark troopers are not made of Beskar because uh, we think we know that lightsabers can cut through them pretty easily. But we'll get to that. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> True. Tom, True. you had a point you wanted to say earlier? I, I did. And Corey, you touched upon it. It was it was at the opening. So when he says, start up the, the dark troopers, and they flash to, that, to the face and chest of that dark trooper, and Corey, you mentioned the music, and that's that's what I want to I want to talk about here for just a second is the music, because it 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 and and the name of the composer, 
you're Louis Gorenson. Gorenson. Okay. Gorenson. Yes. So when he, when that techno, like, like mm-hmm. almost acid techno or heavy techno comes in, it's so magnificent because I, it took me a second. In fact, it, it was the second time I saw it that I really, I was really trying to pay attention. I wasn't sure if that was actually music or if it was sound effects of the cre- of those things warming up. And I just huh. think that that was, that was such a beautiful way to like introduce them with, with music um, that sounds like what we might picture that, that puts the scare into them. That you, and, um, and that, but then, but then what happens next is what I thought was absolutely beautiful because they go from that threatening techno heavy droid feel to the snap to the smoking uh, docking bay or launch bay where the Mandalorian is coming down and you go to his theme, the, you know, that, that piece. Yeah. And it's so quiet and it's so, I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about that theme, but I feel like it's so lonely. And mm-hmm. he comes walking yep. down, he comes walking down the, that ramp and you have that like almost native American sounding Western sounding mm. flute that's going. Mm-hmm. And it, it made mm-hmm. me sit back the second time I saw it. Cause I paused at that time and I sat back and I thought the Mandalorian is truly alone in this rescue. He's got his quadru- you know, his quartet of doom doing their business, leading the way <laughs> and, and whatever, but they've cleared the way and he is alone. And I really felt like now that looking back on hindsight, I really felt like that moment was really foreshadowing what's going to happen in this episode at the end True. is that he's mm. going to, that's, this is his, this is his mission and that's what's going to happen. And I just, I thought it was so beautiful. The juxtaposition of the techno and then this, this, mm, this quiet, alone sort of moment. I don't know. I just, I just thought it was, it was a beautiful juxtaposition of the music and imagery. It really was. It really was. So we, we've got, I think we've, uh, well, gosh, we're barely halfway through. We've got so much more to cover. We could probably spend another couple hours, but instead of that, let's take a really quick break. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free. Go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. I really appreciate our CWK Alliance members, Carol Cantwell, James Kersey, Greg Hargrove, Cato McNichol, Mary Perdue, Terry King, Smooth Rivera, JC Poe, Ed Kimoto, Robert Avila, Dustin Mills, Chelsea Sansbury, Tyler Pampa, Hannah, Alex Procasio, Ian Thompson, David Nicely, Simbot Detradarian, Christine Turk, Ross Halibin, Kurt McQuellen, Dan Ream, Colby Mead, Brian Harding, Frank Mulder, Blake Weaver, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Chris Kavarka, Jeff Ellis, Yancey Evans, Daz Davies, Susan Gray, Thea Selby, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Jim Capron, Connie Shee, Jared Cantor, Jason Hall, Eric Struthers, Greg McLaughlin, Aaron Harris, Mark Suter, Angela Sauce, and Dennis Keithley. 
If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at CWK. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out danzymedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks as always to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. And I can't thank you enough for your help, for your support, and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Let's just go ahead and stop right there, because instead of just talking about this and make it an extra long episode... Let's break this up into a two-parter. We've got the excitement of the Christmas season with it rapidly approaching. So let's stop right there. And we're going to split this episode into a two-parter. I'll release the next one the day after Christmas so everybody can enjoy their time with their family. And then we will continue this exploration of the incredible episode, The Rescue. So much more to discuss. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on Coffee with Kenobi. Again, we're going to stretch this out to two episodes this week because it's so powerful and it's such a long conversation so i want to break it up into two episodes enjoy your christmas have a very very merry christmas and we'll be back with you the day after christmas to talk about the second half of the episode the rescue chapter 16 of the mandalorian merry christmas everybody this is the podcast you're looking for this podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Hold on.